All right, today we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Dr. Danny Bingigi. Um, I know you've all heard him before. Uh, we really appreciate him coming in and filling in for Pastor Mark today. Um, and that, that all the gems that he brings out of the Torah for us. So I'd like to have Danny Bingi come up. Yay, Danny Bingi. To Daraba to you. <laughs> Shalom, everybody. Boker Tov. And not like my students at Arizona State University answered me when I told them Boker Tov, they said, broken toes to you, Danny, too. <laughs> <laughs> broken toes. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and we're going to speak today about some kind of uh, supernatural, strange things. And I did tell the pastor, Mark, that I'm going to share that, and uh, don't take it for granted, you know, what we're we, we are going to talk about the Torah portion, Truma, but there are some very interesting things hidden in this whole chapter or in this whole message, and I want to point it out. We, I did speak about some of that before, but for those who are not here, and we have a lot of, I know El Shaddai have many listeners around the world, and they are watching it right now, and I definitely, I, if I repeat something that you already heard, forgive me, but there are other people that might have not heard it, and I do want to share that. So, um, we will touch about some strange supernatural subjects here, and, but you know, like every else, everything else that is supernatural, it's really anchored very strongly on natural things, you know? Um, so even though it will sound a little strange, look at the reality and how does it translate today to today's reality. And one of them has to do much with an element that we are, uh, that we are encountering in this parasha, in this Torah portion of the week. And of course, there is much um, detail in the Torah portion. You've seen if you look at it at the Bible, you know, from Deuteronomy, I mean, from Exodus 25 to Exodus 27, verse 19, it is filled with descriptions of the entire tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the, um, the, the, um, the display for the bread of, the bread of display, of course, and the compartment that holds it, and miraculously it will stay for a whole week. We're not gonna get to all of those details. They, they are very detailed, you know, in the Bible. You can see the whole details there. Um, rather, we'll concentrate to somebody else. But let's look a little bit, um, not from the very beginning of, uh, and not in the right order of what was made, and a very detailed description of how to make everything. So, <laughs> Where is this whole setting happening? When you look at the first verse in, uh, in Exodus 25, it says, and God spoke to Moses to say, saying, right? Where is, it all, all, where, is it where is this conversation taking place? Somebody knows? It's, it, it, many people think it's in the desert, but actually it is on the top of Mount Sinai. And everything, in, it's in the top of the mountain, and everything that he's saying here, up to chapter 31, at the end of chapter 31, this is many chapters, there is a lot of description, the whole, beside the description of how to build the temple and the ark and everything else, um, there is also many rules of conduct, of behavior, and what you call the law. And you know, sometimes you hear the law, with this kind of a, 
unhappy sound and a discontent, the law. We are free from the law, really. I mean, much of that law that people are putting in this kind of under, undertone is basically saying how to be a good human being, you know? <laughs> much of that law, you know? Be a good person to one another, respect the elderly, respect your father and mother, <laughs> helping the poor, um, not stealing from widows and helping, basically good stuff to make human beings better. And they unfairly receive the undertone of the law. Well, what they mean by that, we'll discuss in the second part, and that probably one aspect of the law, and it's really not the law, it's part of the Torah, and these are the sacrifices. And that part, I can understand when somebody says, oh, that, you know, but it's not the whole law. Also, what is so wrong in not killing others? I mean, what? I mean, this is like, this is the law. That's part of what God put together to make life manageable for people, you know, in a decent way. The second part, of course, was the issue of the sacrifices. And that's why part of the description, description here is the altar that was placed outside the tabernacle. So he talks to him there, and he says something very interesting. You know, the, first, the second verse, I think you have it in your paper. It says, speak to the people of Israel, okay? Speak to the people of Israel that they bring me an offering. The Be'er Israel. I mean, the, even that sentence, you know, the, it's kind of a, has like a, a tone of appeasing. Will you talk to them, please? It's it, almost like a request. And not like, well, you should tell the people of Israel. No, it's not a command. It's like, it's a very soft language used here. And commentators saying, this is the reason. The reason for that is because God is asking for a contribution, which means a personal sacrifice. Some people need to, people need to sacrifice part of their um, well-being or what they have, property, you know. And look what he's asking for. And he says, anyone, whatever his heart allows him, can give. But something interesting that I, I read, like at least 40, 50 different kind of rabbinical commentaries and others about this Torah portion, and I haven't seen one that talks about, well, maybe there are, but I didn't see any that talks about the word itself of the contribution, or what is the offering here in English, truma. Nobody talked about that, but it has a very interesting meaning and aspect behind it. So here we have the, God is asking, and this is the, contrib oh, this is the offering that you'll take from them. And he puts the three elements first, gold, silver, and copper. Gold, silver, and copper, that's what, and copper, this is what he's asking from the people to bring. And here, there's a picture from their tents, and they're bringing, well, looks like a lot of great treasures there. Um, but the word itself, truma, has a very interesting uh, meaning behind it. Truma, in English, the word offering, if you look, try to break down that word, you won't see really much there, offer, you know, it's like off your pocket or, you know, nothing really... But in Hebrew, truma, coming from the word ram, exaltation, something which is high, you know, exalted. But is it not exalted only for the giver? I mean, to the receiver. It's, yeah, of course, it raises up whatever they want to do, the recipients, right? Okay, but it also exalts the giver. And doesn't it feel familiar to you when you did something for another person once, and everybody probably gone through that, not necessarily money, but something that you sacrificed out of your own wealth or assets or what you have, and you gave it to somebody else, and that was an offering in the English year, a contribution or something like that, and it made you feel really exalted. You felt good. And why did you feel good about that? What is so good, you have so much of your assets or whatever, and you, you're giving part of it and you don't get any 
anything in return. You don't, right? Not physically. It's not like you're going to a store and you buy something. That's not a contribution. You buy, you get something in return. But here you did something and you still feel very good. You never got anything in return. It's kind of contrary to the idea of survivalist, right? You know, you survive when you do something for me, I'll do something for you. That's how you, we survive. We exchange, we trade, and so on. But here you do something, where people do something, and they feel exalted. And it is built into the word truma, unlike any other language on the planet. The word itself, the giving in Hebrew, truma, has the word ram, taram, ram, to be exalted, to bring up. So you are bringing up a gift to the temple and to the, uh, not to the temple, but for the, um, the purpose of this truma. But also it exalts the people themselves. And another aspect, which is very connected to that, why would God ask people to bring all that? I mean, you know, they, they wanted, he wanted the people of Israel to be connected and committed to what they're going to receive. So you're giving and you are receiving, but you're receiving things that are completely obligations more than anything else, you know? Like, uh, this is, and this is happening also before receiving the tablets of the covenant. And that happened actually in a very interesting, well, we'll go on, I, I'm jumping ahead. So, um, so this truma that's giving is something that lifts up the people that give and lifts up the, receive, the re recipient, the receivers, right? So there are descriptions there of what to do and all kind of a, and blue and purple. You know what's the blue? The blue is a, a material, a substance that's come out from a, a snail, a small snail. And if you saw the talit, people have, you know, the talit, the prayer shawl, has a little thread of blue. And that blue is not just a paint, it's not just a dye, it's something that is made from a special snail, and it's very difficult and rare to receive. You know, that's the blue. Yeah, a very special thing, you know, that blue. It's called the trelet, it's kind of a light blue. Okay, and, uh, and so is oil for light and, and stones and everything I'm talking here. And then comes something very interesting. In verse 11, if you have it there, okay, so just before, and uh, he talks, about, in, in 9 actually, he talks about, uh, uh, and they make a shrine for me and I will, you know, make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. And this is a tavnit. This is the pattern of the Mishkan. It's called the Mishkan. And now it talks about the Ark. So what is this Ark? Um, it gives a description how to make it. But here comes something interesting. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. Now, why does it need to be um, plated or how did it say overlaid with gold inside who who does see if gold people think and it sounds like there is everything here is gold I mean the whole chapter when you read that there's a lot of gold everywhere right so if that was only for glory and to make it beautiful and honorable and respectable why plating I mean putting a lot of gold inside the ark that is who is going to see that? And you know, it's going to be closed all the time, only once a year. You know, I mean, the, I mean, the priest will go near it and will get there. But why that has to be plated with gold inside? Well, interestingly enough, um, what? Interestingly enough, there is a lot of uh, mentioning of gold um, in the structure of that ark. And look at that. You can see lots of gold around it, right? So let's talk about gold for a second. Not for a second, it's kind of an interesting subject. When we go on, and the verse is, 
the verse is um, okay I'm trying to find it quickly here okay um, what happened I missed up the pages here And when he builds the, when the description goes on, he builds, he asks them to build the, put the two, what do you call that in English? The cherubim, right? Kruvim in Hebrew, the kruvim. And what is the purpose of those kruvim? Why are they there, the kruvim? And if you look at them, I mean, the word kruvim, they, they checked it out in ancient, um, in ancient languages, in like in Aramaic, and they find out that the face of those kruvim, I asked people here before, look at those kruvim, the cherubims, and what do they look like? Old people, young people, they look young. And in many other kind of replica, you can see those are like babies, very young babies, those cherubim. So it brings kind of an interesting question, okay? Um, and the similarity between of those, you know, um, what happens here? Between those, come on, keep on getting here. I don't know. Oh. Okay. You can look at here too, you know, this is a different kind. But they look like young, you know? And look how closely that culture, I can't close stuff here. Look how closely this culture is connected. First of all, what's the reason that them, those be babies, you know? And in other languages, in Aramaic, in other, it does speak about the Caribbean being like babies, images of babies with the wings there. And it didn't go that far. Look at that, the Romans and the Greek in their mythology, they're very much similar to the Cupids there, as you can see. Okay, so they, of course they took it from the idea of the, of the Kerubim, the Cherubim, right? But the most interesting thing about the Cherubim is, I'm trying to find the verse here, I missed up, I kind of mixed up the pages here. The most interesting part there Okay, so the, the reason of the ark, the main reason of the ark, it says here that you will keep there, in verse 16, it said, and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. So, and that testimony is the testament. It's basically the testament, which, what is a testament? What is, the, it's not a testimony. God is not on the witness, you know, stand that is need to give it this testimony. It's a testament. And that testament is a will, in a way. You know, it's a will. And that needs to be placed in. But furthermore, furthermore, that will be the place that God it says to, um, to Moses, I will speak to you from there. This is the place I will speak to you. What verse is that? Let's find it, the speaking. That, that's, that, this is where I will meet you and I will speak with you. That's exactly right, 22. Now, my, my pages here got messed up. So, it says, and there I will meet with you, and I will talk with you from above the cover. Listen to this. From between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of testimony, of all things which I will give you in commandments to the people of Israel. So this is the place right here in between those two. Oops. In between those two, um, oh, where did it go? 
I don't know how to put that. God will speak right in between these two to Moses or to the, to the high priest. What's the reason for that? God has many ways to talk to people, right? Can you think of some way? Vision could be one. What else? What else comes to mind? In a dream. In a dream, right. That's another way to do that. What is another way that God can speak to human beings? In a tiny voice. In a tiny voice. And also through prophets, right? He can speak through prophets. So there are many, many, many ways of speaking. And one of them is mentioned in, later on in this context. And we're going to talk about that. It's called the Urim and Tumim. Have you heard that word before? Urim, you did? Some of you, some of you did not? Okay. Um, so these are means of communication. But now let's talk about what's happening there. God still is going to speak to the people from here, to the Moses or to the high priest, from right between those two. And there is a very interesting reason for that. So let's talk a little bit about gold, okay? So here, I got some facts here. Give me a second. About gold. Always happens with these pages. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it from memory. I'll do it from memory. Okay, I, I'm missing a page. So, um, the reason that everything there is in gold is suspicious to, somewhat, to some degree. What is the reason? And, and this has to do also with speaking, you know, from that arc. So here is something about gold. There was ample use of gold mentioned in this uh, description meant only for, is that only meant for beauty and glory? Well, gold is an essential component in making high-end electronic equipment, and in particular with high-end audio devices. Many times you see if you want to connect a TV or something, you can buy a regular connection, HDMI, but some of them, if you want really good connection without hearing cracking noises, you buy one that is plated with gold. With gold. Or oh, just like a fact of, of, of technology. Now, gold is highly conductive. This is a very conductive substance, meaning, meaning electricity can easily flow through it with minimal resistance, okay? So... Like if you run electricity in audio or in anything else or in electronics and computers and telephone, you know, through copper, a lot of that, is, it's a good conductor. Mainly we use copper because it's cheap, right? You know, the electric wires that you see between cities, they're all copper, made of copper or aluminum, you know? And they have, but some of the electricity is getting lost. I don't know the percentage, but it's pretty high. Maybe 30% of what is produced is getting lost because it's not conductive enough. Conductive meaning let the electricity run through it without loss, okay? Copper, silver, and aluminum are also conductive, but gold offers a superior level of electrical conductivity. As a result, it is the perfect material for electronic components like those that we mentioned here. Okay, so when used in electronics, gold allows, yeah, we, we, okay. So the thermal conductivity of gold is considerably 313 W, never mind. Uh, okay, so when the thermal, but it's a little bit the thermal, meaning the heat that it, 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 lets, it allows through, is uh, high, is lower than copper. You know, so meaning that if you use gold, it will it will tend to heat up less likely. It will it will not heat up so much. 
Um, so gold, with gold wires, this will stay much cooler, the system will stay much cooler, and that's why they will tend to use it in every computer. Every cell phone and every equipment of this gold is used. Um, with an average of price of nearly $2,025 per ounce as of February 2024, gold ranks of the one of the most expensive metals in the world. Even with its high price, though, it's commonly used by the manufacturer of electronics. From desktop to laptop computers to smartphones, electronics, all of them contain gold. In fact, most electronics contain at least some amount of this precious material, almost everything that is made. So why do manufacturers use gold rather than cheaper? Obviously, better conductivity, but more than that, it also has resistance to tarnishing. Um, copper and silver is also conductive. They tarnish easily. They don't look good. They got dirty, and uh, the effect is not so good. Have you happened to you that you put headphones before and you heard <laughs> that sound? Conductivity is not good, and, and, and the break and so on. It doesn't happen with gold. It stays very stable and very good. Okay, so the benefits of gold in electronic doesn't stop there. In addition to the high electrical conductivity and being easy to work, the precious metal is resistant to tarnishing. Gold doesn't mix well with oxygen. So everything else does. Copper does, you know, you get green, you saw that before. And even, even uh, silver tarnishes quickly, becomes black, you know, can, can get spots of black. And eventually they will hamper, hamper connect, uh, the conductivity and the connection if it comes to communication. Even when left outside for a long period of time, it will absorb little or more of their, you know, uh, of oxygen and will, not, it will tarnish. Not with gold. The last thing is gold. It's very, very fine, and you can work with it. It's flexible. It's a soft material, so it, they can get to the very tiny microscopic areas and use gold there in the electronic uh, equipment. Now we, came, we come to this thing. So everything is gold. It's gold inside, gold outside. It's a hint. I'm not saying this is the fact, right? But the fact in verse 22, God says, I will speak to you between those two. So when you have speakers at home, how many of them normally, traditionally, how many of them you have? Two, right? One from here, one from there. You can hear stereo in between, right? Um, there are some advanced ones. You put five and six and 15 and new cars come with 32 speakers, you know. But basically, two will do a great job, right? And still, God wants to speak with him in between those two. Now, look at those. Those are wings, okay? Look at me for a second. And I'm not a pastor, I'm just a teacher. But think of pastors, rabbis, professors in cathedrals, in university, and so on. What do they do? Especially preachers, okay? I'll drop the microphone for a second. They do this. seen that before? Yeah. Yeah. What does it look like? Okay. Extended wings, right? You do that. And do you do that from below upwards? Did you see professors or pastors or preachers lying on the floor and talking to the audience as they sit up? No, they don't. So they do it from high, from above, below, right? From above, below. That's the idea of extending wings or the hands, the arms. So when you come to bless people, is it common to see that happening, right? You put hands above their heads. You're exerting something out. It's called in other cultures, they call it channeling or whatever you want to call it, right? But this is the action of kind of casting down a blessing. But casting, well, it's irrelevant for this issue, but casting could be both of blessing and of curses. Same way. But look what happens in the techn technology today. 
You cannot watch TV out of the air, not by cable, but even the cable company, if you don't get a link from above, and it used to be like before satellites, you know, cable companies will have to go and in every city they find a high place and they put those towers. You can see them almost in every city in America. They pick one mountain, they put the, the big towers, and they cast down to their, uh, they, they broadcast, you know, what kind of broadcast, it's casting down, and TV sets or, you know, other kind of distributors will pick up the signal. Or it's casting now down from satellites, right? Same idea. It's casting it down. In biblical um, history, we can see that blessing and curses come the same way. They need to be casted down. I, I mentioned, and I like this story, I mentioned it several times in my teaching, about Balaam, the story of Balaam. I don't know, I did it here too, but if some people did not hear the story, Balaam was hired to curse the people of Israel. And there was a big struggle, he couldn't do it, and they offered him more. Balak ben Zippor, the king, offered him more and more. And eventually, he was on a high-rise mountain over the Jordan Valley, you know, watching the people of Israel in their tents below, you know. And that was the perfect condition for either blessing or cursing, right? Because he is above, can extend his hands, and cast down a curse. This is what he was hired for. And instead of that, he stands there and he says, Ma tovu ohalecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Israel. The curse turned to a blessing, and he says, How goodly are your tents, O Israel, I mean, Israel, O Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. So the curse turned into a blessing. But the action was done the same way. He was high, rise, above, the subjects of the so intended curse that turned to a blessing and emanated one of the most wonderful blessings that every Jew says every morning. It's part of the morning prayer, you know? So that's what happened to this curse. But it's still done, done from above and it was casting down. And there is no coincidence that those two cherubs and there is description, description here, I mean, the instructions here also calling from them to extend their wings, right? Their wings should be extended, extended. So why couldn't they rest and just put them behind? I mean, they have to, you know, there was a reason, we don't know exactly, but we put together several aspects of the story here. You know, the use of gold, yes, could be for beautification, but yes, it could be also used for that purpose that God says, I will talk to you from there. So this is not a guess, right? In verse 30, 22 again, this is where I meet you, right? And from there, I will speak with you, and this is where I meet you, and I will talk to you, with you from above the cover, from between the two cherubim. In between those two stereo Cherubim, I'll talk to you. So, uh, let us talk about um, another aspect here. So, these are the ways of speaking, right? We can, God speaks to them, but we don't know exactly what. But let's, let's refine it a little bit further. So, um, it mentioned there the first time, for the first time, there's the mentioning of the Urim and Tumim. Urim and Tumim. If you read later on in this uh, portion and, and beyond that, you'll find the word Urim Betumim. So what are those Urim Betumim? The word is kind of strange, right? Urim and Tumim, but there is a hint there. So in this, okay, so we'll take a deep dive into one of the greatest mysteries, basically, of the Bible um, that has a, with a possible hint for deciphering it, okay? Urim and Tumim was a mysterious means of communication of, with God, from, with God 
for answers of crucial questions from the king, from the ki from kings, leaders, and the high priest Hakohen Hagadol in Hebrew. Okay, it was placed in uh, over the breastplate of um, the breastplate of the judgment worn by the high priest over his heart. Right, when he goes before the Lord, listen to that. When he goes before the Lord, and that's in Exodus twenty-eight thirty. The concept becomes even stranger because it contradicts the core teaching of the Bible that future telling is forbidden. I mean, wh what is this allowance of having the future being f foretold to people, kings or whatever? Wh what's the point? I mean, it's the future is forbidden, right? As we know, like for instance, here's a sentence. The, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belongs to us. Deuteronomy 29, 28. The secret things, be, things belongs to God, and the revealed things are for us, who are not for the secrets. And it appears again, this concept becomes even stranger because, you know, and it, it, the only legit future telling was by God himself through prophets. That's future telling, but it has a purpose of warning and trying to prevent something from happening. Comes to the fact that God knows, of course. I mean, we, we understand the two concepts that God, know, God knows in, in advance what's happening, right? He tells Jeremiah, before I made you in the womb, I've known you, right? He knows, but, but still, when he tells the prophet, hey, warn them from something, so there is room here for preventing something from happening, right? If you have a, if that's going to happen anyway, what's the point to tell the prophet to warn people? It's not going to help if it's going to happen anyway. You see the point here? If it's going to happen for granted, you can come and, and cry out in, the, in the street corners from now until the end of the universe and nothing will change it. So there is an option here to change the course of events. That's an interesting concept, right? And the prophets come and warn. Okay, but, but, the, the verse sums up, um, it happened again, you know, um, it happened again. The only, okay, so the, this is the only legit option, right? The, this verse sums up to the, the two all the options of the two-way communication with God. Listen to this. And that's for 1 Samuel 26, 8. And it says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, okay, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, as you mentioned before, right? Some people said that's one way that God talked. Neither by dreams, nor by Urim, that's the Urim and Tumim we talk here, nor by the prophets. Here are the three things that are communication that God that we recognize in the Bible. So he answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. First Samuel. Urim is surely mentioned here as a means of communication with God. People cannot address God directly um, with questions about the future. Right? You, you, can, you can try, but you know, you don't really. So he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or, or, or the seasons which the Father has set them, right? It isn't for you to know the times and season, And within his own authority, Acts 1-7, right? So we can, you know, many t you, you probably can feel sometimes that your prayer had been answered a prayer, something you're hoping, it was deep in your heart, and you requested, and, and it did, and you know that God hurt you. Y you know, many people report that, you know, I, I know that I did that, and I did get a response. In a, in a different way, it could be something unusual happened, a sound in the house, or something different, you know, but you can see a sign, and you decipher it as an answer to a request or a prayer. 
But we don't, I mean, it's not common that people, ordinary people talk, and I hear some reports, people say, well, you know, I did see God, and, or Jesus, and I, I, you know, I asked him, tell me, and he goes, and I goes, and he goes, and I go, I, you know. Nice stuff, but not common, you know, and it cannot be proved. I mean, do, go ahead, record this conversation and play to us, you know, but nobody did, you know. So, um, but then comes the, again the question, why on earth God will allow such an instrument as the Urim and Tumim? Why, why you will allow something like that? You can see also in Nehemiah 70, 765, nobody can reconcile the contradiction with a reasonable answer. We, we try to find answers for that. Why? Why are you going to do that? I mean, maybe just to stop, again, stop some course of events from happening, but sometimes it doesn't even help, because when King, when Saul, before the big war, went, went to the, um, the, he went to uh, Endor, you know, to speak with the saucer, you know, the, um, the, the woman there, the witch, you know, and she did bring up, brought up the spirit of the prophet, and he told him, well, whether you go, you go to the war, but you're not going to come back. You're going to die. So the, King Saul knew that this is, the, he told him the future. He foretold him the future. So with basic, you know, what kind of instrument allows, but you know, that's really an interesting thing. What kind of instrument allowed remote voice communication with God? What kind of instrument is that? The common belief is that the Urim and the Tumim were the precious gems set on the high priest's breastplate. Were they o but the question is, were they only precious gems? Did you have diamonds talking to you before, or rubies? You know, you have the ruby and say, oh, how are you doing? Well, I'm fine, you too. Man. You know, they don't talk, those gems. They look, you know, but when you put them together, you place them, um, with basic knowledge of Hebrew, a different under answer will pop up in, your, in front of your eyes. Just by looking at the first word of tumi, Urim and Tumim, you hear the word Urim. It's coming from the word Or. Or is light in Hebrew, right? The very first, in the creation there, it says, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, let there be light, or be light. Vayehi Or. Or is light. So this is the hint. Urim and Tubim must be some kind of an instrument because, look, this is ordinary people, like still high priest, but it's a person, right? And he needs to talk to God, and talking meaning you say words and you hear back words, you know, from God. So it must be an instrument that allowed to do that. It's not a dream, and it's not in a vision. It's an actual, factual instrument, a device that creates, that, that allows sound. So the first word is urim, and that hints that it could be something with an instrument that emits light. It will lead you, and the answer leads you to the light. The first letter, or, means light. The significance hint may mean instrument of communication which emits light. Question is, if that sounds familiar to you, an instrument that emits light, do you also happen to use some device that has audio and emits light? You probably do. And why believing and, 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 and assuming there wasn't something like that there at that time? Why we have to assume automatically that there wasn't the, the knowledge of an instrument that emits light in that Urim and Tumim that allowed that to happen? You know, to, because everything else is mentioned. The communication is mentioned. Talking is mentioned between those two. Cherubim, this is casting. This is where we cast, right? The wings, the whole idea of the wings is casting. So um, here is a, an idea. 
But the idea is gone. Where is the idea? <laughs> Let me see. No, I, it was here, you know. Oh, here we go. So this is the high priest. And it could be whatever was placed on the breastplate, breastplate was a means of communication that emitted light. What is the sound? <laughs> <laughs> <It's a tra> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Talk about signs. <laughs> Talk about signs here and some voices. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is the and then the word to meme. The second word to meme. We don't know really what it means. <laughs> we try to figure it out. To meme. It could mean to meme. It could mean completeness, wholeness, or truth. Perhaps a reference to God, you know? Now look, and we showed you how the cherubim, the kruvim, really transferred later on to the Romans and to the Greek. And they used those images of babies with wings as their cupids and angels and all that stuff. It came from this kruvim. But this is not the only thing that they stole, you know. What else did they steal? The Greek and Roman mythologists also stole the idea of communicating with superior power and, and, and consulted with their gods, in lower case, via what? The oracle, right? They called them the oracle, okay? But they also stole the name. Do you know, look at this, at the word oracle. You hear the word or there? Or, like in Urim. So there is light. And you know, in the word oracle, what the second part of the word means? Sound or voice. Or is light. Call is sound or voice. So their oracle is a combination of light and sound or voice. How strange that could be, you know? And how much stealing they do, they do that from the Hebrew? You know, the Urim and Tumim. A, 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 an instrument that produces light and sound at the same time. So, um, you see the aura, the or in the word oracle. Now, vi viable answers to important questions are often compared to shining light on darkness, right? You shine light or darkness, which is associated with ignorance. Darkness is associated normally with ignorance and uncertainty. It's dark. You don't know what's there. You can see. You can predict. You can, you know, anticipate. It's dark. But it also dark people. We refer to people that are ignorant. They're not open. Their mind is blocked. They're dark. Dark souls and so on. This is the connection between the word enlightenment that has the word light in it in enlightenment the highly valued gold goal of education is enlightening right this is probably the reason for the historical decision of the founders of yale university and indiana indiana university to choose the hebrew description inscription of urim and tumim as their logos. You go to a sports store and say, I want the Yale University, and you'll see in Hebrew, Urim Vetumim. Until this very day, that's what they use as their logo. It's the logo of the University of Indiana State and also um, of Yale University, which is a you know, prestigious university in the US. The Urim, the Urim has to do probably with the enlightenment, the or. But then they took the Hebrew word, the, the, the description in the Bible from our subject, the Urim and Tumim. Our time is up. Okay. So we'll continue. Um, uh, bring up some kind of interesting subject from the New Testament in the next session. And I'll continue something else with the old. We that's the break? Okay. So thank you. I'll see you again in a few minutes. Okay. Toda. All right. Thank you, Dr. Danny Bengigi, for that uh, message and enlightening us on the Torah. Um, we're going to uh, have the uh, uh, closing prayer for the first session. 
and then we're going to go to a 20-minute break. So if we could, oh, okay. All right, if we could all stand. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with your whole counsel of your living word by the power of the Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. All right, let's take a break. Okay, to Darabah. Before we jump into, jump into the next section, which is really a combination of love and, and well-needed correction of distortions. And I'll tell you in a minute what I'm about to talk about, uh, what I'm talking about. But before that, there is something really, a precious moment happened during the break. We were talking about the, the gold, and the refined nature of gold. And here comes a lady, Mary Jo, and she's showing me, and why don't you let her speak it in her own words, okay? Just for a minute, just that. Mary Jo is a musician, she's a teaching music, and she's, uh, you know, um, a, a, a great musician of, a, uh, the, yeah, the violin, but she, she has something that she told me touch my heart. Well, I just came to Danny to show him my violin because I use an, an E-string gold-plated variety because it, um, I don't know if they can see the gold on this skinny string right here. Okay, like that. Okay. And um, the best strings are gold-plated. It's a very thin string, so it sounds really, you know, annoying when it's just steel tinnish, you know, that's where they get that sound, uh, they call it a tinnish sound or tin sound, and so when they played it with gold, it sounds sweet and beautiful. Amazing. Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you so Mary Jo. This, <laughs> that is pretty amazing, and it has to do with sound, and here is just a proof, living proof, that the sound is really enhanced beautifully, and you know, the violin is in Hebrew, it's considered to be the instrument of the heart. Yes, it is. And the gold makes it more refined and more, how did she put it in the word? More sweet sound and soft. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to take you to a little dive to the domain of Pastor Mark Biltz. You know, um, you probably know that uh, Pastor Mark is doing something which is going to be affecting generations of people. And I hope and I see the potential of having a Bible that like never before. Like never before. Pastor Mark built, and I'm going to give you an example. We're, we're going to talk about New Testament here, I'll show you. And that's a demonstration of basically what Pastor Mark was doing. Um, he brought it to attention of many people at El Shaddai. Uh, that there are inaccuracies, to say it in a soft manner, in the translation of the New Testament. Inaccuracies. So we know, I, and I know it, I'm very aware of the subject, that um, any translation, any Bible in a version that you have, is a subject to be, to some degree, away from the word, you know, the one that is in Hebrew, okay, the original. But I'm not talking about New Testament, I'm talking even about the Old Testament, just for a moment. So that happens because of a normal process of conveying a, a message to in an, into another language. So there are normal barriers in language. I, I heard that there are at least 10 or 15 different meanings to the word white in the language of the people 
that are in the north, you know, the, the tribes there in, in Eskimo, they have different kind of white. You know, they're the white of the eyes of people. There is the white of the dog. There's the white of the snow. We only know the one word, white. You know, I mean, we don't think of too many aspects of that. But they have many different meanings and different words for white. How do you translate from that language to another and so on? But when it comes to the Bible, um, people from different backgrounds sat down. And that's why there were 70 or 72 people translating the Bible into English um, in order to avoid so-called bias and, and um, desertion from the main word. You know, they had to decide together, but they didn't work together. Each one then tra translated a different portion. And the inevitable happens in every English Bible, or Spanish, or Turkish, or you name it. And this is due to normal um, variations because of the mind, of the, of, the, of the thinking of the person, and limitation, normal human um, under, you know, um, underst not understanding completely the essence of a word. In a, in a language, and it's really hard to get into this. But the word of God is written in Hebrew in order to stay. And I think we talked about before, but I'll mention it again. People sometimes ask me, do you know what kind of a, they ask me what kind of a, what version of the Hebrew Bible you're using? And when they say that, I know that they are not familiar with the idea that there is no such thing. I, I tell them, oh, I'm using the one that Jesus was using. This exactly the same Bible. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, exactly the same, very same one that he was using, you know. Wow, how did you get that? <laughs> very simple, you know. Unlike in English that you have so many versions of the Bible, really. Um, well, apparently the King James is considered to be, I mean, I know there are NIV and there is New American Standard and all that, but the King James is considered to be by many people as the most close, the closest one to the original Hebrew from which it came, you know. And it's true besides the distortion and then, I'll, you know, the, the variations. But the Hebrew, there is no, no, no such thing as two versions of the Hebrew Bible. So the question is not valid, what version of the Hebrew Bible you're using, no such thing. I mean, there are different printers that put it together, you know, in New York and Chicago, and that, but it must be the same. And, and you, we learn about that too. There is a testimony of Jesus himself, in Yeshua himself, in the New Testament. When they come to him, the people in, you know, they know uh, the Pharisees and the Prushim and Tzadokim, and they tell him, you know, we saw that you allowed, allowed in, in the sense he's being a rabbi, a teacher and a leader at the time of his life on earth. And you're allowing kind of work on Shabbat, you know. And that work was for saving a life of a person. But, and he, meaning that he changed the Bible. It said, because the Bible says no work at all on that day whatsoever in any circumstance. No, okay. And then he tells them, so they come and basically accusing him of changing the Bible, changing the Bible. This is the people of his time. And he tells them the very famous statement, not a jot and a tittle would be changed from the, not from the law. You see, once again, this kind of a word, law, law, <laughs> you know, not from the law, from the Bible, from the Torah. Not a jot and tittle will be changed from the Bible as long as the earth is still here. And he means he's talking from the jargon of the scribes. Now the scribes are the, it's a special group of people that their job, they were assigned to copy Torah books from generation to generation. So when they take it, you know, if you've seen Hebrew characters, in Torah or in mezuzah, you see they have small little serifs on the tip of the letters on the top. And those are the jots and the tittles. Now they are meaningless, not in sound. They don't have any difference in the sound of the word when you read it with the jots or without. 
It's just an appearance, okay? So you can take it away, it's still the same word. The meaning is the same, the sound is the same. So why are they there? And the reason for that is very much knowledge of the human heart that God had. He knew that, you know, that if somebody will give, he knew that people had to copy Bible books for next generation. And, and so is mezuzahs and the feeling. They have to copy it. And if they have the authority and the liberty to copy, they may make some distortions and mistakes and so on. So he made a, 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 a kind of, a, I don't know if it's a device or a system that will prevent it, prevent it. So we know Torah was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and God himself wrote it in his own finger, right? First time until Moses broke and then, okay. So it is coming to Moses for the people on the Mount. And the belief is that uh, that was given to the priest, the high priest, and to the priest, and from there to the fathers, and father to the sons until this very day. But those serifs were there, the small little serifs, the jots and tittle. And even though there are, has no meaning and no differentiation in sound, it will sound the same, and it will mean the same, they still have to be exactly as it was in the original Bible. So now the people that do that is not ordinary people can come and they copy Bible, you know, from a congregation. You have one here in El Shaddai, wonderful one, or one or two. Pastor Mark showed it. Um, so when you when they copy the Bible, they have to keep the little serifs identical to as it was in the original. Now it's very easy to miss those, you know. So there is 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. One of them is the tiniest is the letter Yud, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's about a third of a size of a regular, ordinary character. The tip of the serif on that one is almost invisible to naked eye. So many times when they check the scribes, when they write a Torah book, they have to come with magnifying equipment to look at those jots. But even, so now you understand. So if the idea is God knew man's heart, and he knew that if one person will take the liberty to change the jot, another one can take the liberty to change a character, or maybe a word, or maybe a whole sentence. And who knows, after several generations, how far people will get from the word that God intended to give in the first place. So the jot and the tittle is something very minute, yet extremely important that one needs to insist on in order to keep things as they are. So when they told Jesus, oh, you changed that, he said, me? I don't allow to change even the tip of the serif of the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, let alone changing a word or a whole law or a whole commandment of God. That was the answer. So there is only one Bible in Hebrew. No such thing as two versions, you know. Even the one that you found in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran is still identical. In some places, because of copying, there were a, a change in the word. But nobody knows if that happened because it got erased or something and somebody fixed it later on. It's still a very rare and very unusual, and there is only one Bible in Hebrew. But when it comes to English, and this is a translation, many times the deviations from the word, that as it was, you know, and originally, the deviations are innocent, are happening because of people did not fully grasp the meaning of the word in Hebrew, and they conveyed it to the best of their ability. And this is giving the grace to the translators of many of the, vers of the, of the verses in the Bible, not versions, verses. But sometimes this grace was not there, um, and we can see what we call value-embedded departures from the word, you know? Like in one of the cases is, has to do with money, you know? It does say in the Hebrew, if you bring, that's about contribution, truma, like we spoke in the first one. 
So the rich should not give more than half a shekel for the atonement of their souls, and the poor should not give less than half a shekel, right? But somebody changed it and put and put the poor, the rich should give more than half a shekel for the atonement. Atonement. So now comes the principle of the church in Rome, the early one. The more you give, the more atonement you're getting, and the more pardon you'll get. So you can go and I almost said the word celebrate, but no, not celebrate. <laughs> well, go ahead and become as sinner as you want, because the money will cover that. So that, believe it or not, strangely enough, one of the Bibles there took out the word not. You should give more than half a shekel. Now that departure is not innocent, to say the least, you know? No, because they didn't want to, okay, the rich will give half a shekel. Oh, you have a lot more. So that takes away the idea, but the idea was that people are equal for the atonement, you know? You're not better ones because you have more money or, you know. Okay, so that's one thing. But then you look and there are many, 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 a lot, maybe 50, 60. I heard of one version, it's called the street stock language Bible, you know? Like, I didn't see that one, but I heard there is a Bible like that. So what does it say there? And Moses says that, and God goes, and he goes, and I, what? And he says, buddy, would you go, you know, what is in the street talk Bible? I mean, and, and the, the idea is understandable. You want to reach out to the Bible to different people and embrace them with love of the word and get to their soul and their spirits and their hearts. Nice. But you can't change the book. You can talk about it in any word that you want, but don't print it and don't call it Bible. So we go to the source, you know, the one that most people have. And we're talking about the New Testament King James, which is considered to be, again, a very, very reliable source of, of uh, copying the Bible. Keen work of translation, yet Pastor Mark builds has shown me and showed the congregation and showed the people that around the world that there are mistakes there and distortions and some things that are, I don't really want to accuse here anything, but let, he'll explain it. And he came up with the idea of doing the Bible, which is probably gonna be the most accurate Bible in the world, in English for the New Testament. Like he shared with me, I'm working with Pastor Mark on that, and we are very excited. I mean, I'm adding my little Hebrew knowledge. He's my teacher. I am his student, but I share my knowledge with Hebrew to get everything in the accuracy. And Pastor offers, and you know, I'm checking it in like 50 different places in um, databases of ancient Hebrew and all that that I have access to and then it's okay, and I know it's okay. Now, my personal experience was, and I know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not good in many things, believe me, you know, people say, oh, would you be a rabbi? So, oh, 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 rabbi, what, what rabbi? <laughs> rabbi, you need to be, <laughs> you need to be beyond reproach, and believe me, I'm very reproachable, no. <laughs> rabbi, I cannot be, no, don't talk to me, rabbi. And I have so many disadvantages. If I start talking about them, you live here at night, you know? <laughs> One thing I, I thought I'm kind of, uh, you know, the, we, we all have the, <laughs> how do you say, the gift of the spirit that God gave us. One could be a great carpenter, which is the gift of the spirit. And another one, and I, you know, I told my daughter yesterday, I spoke with her in Israel, I said, you know, my dream was, I was 14, 11 years old, and I lived in a small town in Israel. I was a child, my father was very poor. He was a policeman, you know, and policemen in Israel, believe me, very poor, very poor. Not today, but at that time when I grew up, very poor. I mean, <laughs> He bought his first car when he was 55 years old, and it was a Volkswagen Beetle, 24 years old car. That was his first car in the age of 54, you know, and he died in no time, you know, but the car, the car. And, but with the little money that they had, I was the only person, yeah, child in the city with a microscope. My father bought me a microscope that magnified 1,200 times. Wow! The whole city was standing in, can I watch her? Yeah. All right. <laughs> So I told my daughter yesterday, I want, you know, I want, I really was dreaming to be a scientist. And he said, but you are dead. You're a scientist of words. 
I said, oh, well, that's nice, you know. Uh, so I do have access, and, and you also need to check and see ancient resources to find out what's hidden in the world, in the world. And we call it, the principle that I kind of developing, and it's called um, the subatomic dissection of words. Subatomic, you break it down to very tiny, small particles, and you get right to the core of the meaning of the word. But it's really hard labor. It's nothing to do with uh, you know, being genius or something like that. It's really hard labor and persistence and not letting anything influence you except for the, the, what you see in a word. In a word, and you dissect it to the smallest particles. There was an interesting opportunity then where McDonnell Douglas, the, the maker of the helicopter, of the Apache, you know, the leading, the world leading helicopter, their chief test pilot called me up one day, and he's the only one, one of two pilots in the world that can fly a helicopter upside down. Only two. There's a video of McDonnell Douglas that he does that. He's the chief test pilot, but he's also the, the top engineer of a... Uh, at the time, McDonnell Douglas. Now it's, I think it's Boeing. And he called me and he said, what, what can I do for you? I, said, I want to learn Bible with you. I said, with me? I said, yeah, with you. And this is a top scientist. I mean, he's a scientist, you know. And he comes and he taught me to develop that kind of approach of the subatomic. So we'll take a verse from the Bible and dissect it together very slow. Not running with the Bible. No, slowly break it down, and wow, what you discover when you do that kind of work. Amazing things come up, and, and you know, and I really adopted it. He's, he's the only pilot, American pilot, that is, uh, he's not allowed to go to almost any place in the world, except for Israel, and he fly, he flew a helicopter over Jerusalem, armed helicopter, foreign pilot flying over Jerusalem in Apache, and he trained the Israeli. But anyway, that's him. But he's a very, very deep in, in, in the system. And he taught me how to become subatomic researcher of words, you know. And um, I'm working with Pastor Mark on that level now. So Pastor Mark sees the things that most people cannot detect because he can do, he does in his mind amazing cross references between one verse here, and he knows what inspired that verse in the Old Testament. So he can see, re and then he does the correction. I mean, last week we did something, I worked with him on the computer, and um, we discovered some, and he edited it, and we both start screaming out of joy, you know, really. Wow, that's how the Bible should be. I'll give you an example. I, I hope Pastor Mark is watching me and he's not mad at me. But he pointed out something that hit me in the head. And he says, look, look, I'm reading in the New Testament. He said, well, they came to the church and church and churches and church. and said, what church? The first church was established about 300 years after the events of the New Testament have ended. You know, what church? There were no churches at the time. No such thing as church for 300 years, you know, after the whole thing. What is the New Testament is about? What, what is the, you know, these are letters, right? Written by whom to whom? The gospel and the letters are basically the, I, I'll define the New Testament as S-Y-S. Save your souls. It's an outcry of stop and hold the bad direction that people are going. Written by Jews in the land of Israel to brother Jews in the islands and in, 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 in Greece and in Turkey and in other places. And this was like a cry of stop. Stopping what? You know, like in every era, we have different fads happening, right? The new fad at the time was the re religions that came from the East. And that is, you know, the Ishtar, and everybody was all crazy about that stories of the Ishtar. The Immaculate Conception was actually born there, and that's why they have the Easter eggs. Ishtar, Easter, some connection. 
Um, and it came from the East, and they believed in her as the goddess and so on. Now, who are those people? Those are Jews, and they had synagogues in, in Galicia, in Corinthia, in Ephesia, in all those places. And those places are quite affluent. They are like the New York and Los Angeles and London of the time. Very intellectual people, great in art, in music, in everything, very advanced, you know. And those people have been out of Israel by exile. And their brother, you look at the books, it says to our Jewish brothers in Ephesia and Korea, right? The letters are written to Jewish people by Jewish brothers in the land, calling them to stop the wrong course they're going with the Eastern religions, religions and go back to God and understand there is salvation in the world. And his name is Yeshua. The salvation is yours. Don't leave because they're desperate. They're in exile. They didn't see the light in the end of the tunnel. And he tells them, no, the letters of the New Testament are telling them, no, there is light, there is hope, there is salvation. And that's how they learn about it. And they embraced it, luckily. You know, luckily they embraced it and fulfilled the prophecy of the prophet, several prophets. They say, for, give me some for, from Zion, Torah will come forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And look at that. Large part of the world now believes in what the prophet said, Isaiah. And by, ver by the virtue of whom? Is that happening because of Moses or because of David? No. It happens because of Yeshua, Jesus, you know. And so the prophecy had been fulfilled. Whether you accept it or you don't accept it, Factually, it's a fact. It, the whole millions and billions of people now believe in that, and the prophecy had been fulfilled, and we're talking facts only. You can reject anything you want, but this is a fact. And it does happen, did happen because of Yeshua. You can't deny that. It's undeniable. You can, be, you can deny anything you want. You can't deny facts, you know? Or like, <laughs> like how, did he, how did he put it, Mark Twain? And he said... Uh, it's very, uh, I, I forgot, I'll come back, it will come back. I, I thought of something else that you were saying, you know. It is saying if the facts don't support my hypothesis, then the hell with the facts, you know. <laughs> I'll stick to what I think and I don't care what the facts are, but we're talking about real facts here. Okay, so they received that and they joined and they dropped their idol worshiping i mean at that time really there were two kinds of people but you understand that there were pagans in europe and all over pagans that had statues and so on in every home and there were jewish people that they knew that the god is in heaven there is only one god not multiple and there is in is in heaven and when and they, they start getting affected by the Eastern religions, which is trading one kind of uh, cutesy mootsy goddess, you know? I mean, idols, two different kind of idols, you know? And they, it stopped, and it stopped, and this is forming now the new faith called the new, I mean, the, the Christianity was formed. But it took about 260 to 300 years until the first church was established. Before that, there were only synagogues. And Pastor Mark shows it and says, look at that. I mean, what, why you, this is an anachronistic usage of the word. I mean, the intention here is community or con better, congregation. So this is like, I'm kind of a, you know, this is one of the changes that is there in the Bi Mark Bill's Bible. And it's necessary and it's been waiting for thousands of years to happen. I mean, hundred, many hundreds, right? From the 1600s. Um, at least, you know, five, 500 years to, it, it waited to happen. And it happens now and he's doing that. Pastor Mark is very brave in taking the stance and fixing what needs to be fixed. And he doesn't distort anything, he restores. The, this Bible is the restoration but there are some, this is a nice, um, this is a very simple, but I'm going to show you one that is not so simple, and Pastor Mark has a lot more. I don't know if he's, he's probably teaching you here, you heard him saying things that are not correct 
in the Bible and he corrects them. But the idea was Pastor Mark has been teaching for years and I saw that and he has books here and books there and video here and a video there. And I was thinking, what happens in about 200 years from now? I mean, how do you get all his amazing teaching in one place? It must be in one Bible. That's the Mark Builds Bible. So it's built in such a way, but it's more than that. We build it up so it will be on every computer, on every, you know, even on the phone or iPads. People can go and, they, and inside, inside, when you go over the verses, over the verses, you will click in certain area and you hear the commentary of Ma Pastor Mark on different verses. So that's, nobody in the world has done anything like that as far as we check. There are some Bible with audio commentary, but that commentary is like an hour and a half speech, you know, you click and, uh, uh, no, you, it's too much, you know. So this is going just certain verses that he has, that he's been teaching for 30 years, small click, and you can hear what he has to say so this is like the entire w life work of the pastor in one Bible. And then on top of there'll be thousands of things there. But in top of that, there'll be the corrections that are really due to be made to the King James. And it's time that the world will be brave enough and embrace the Bible that is more accurate than anything else. People did changes, but they didn't go far away from that. You know, they, they stayed with the same distortions. And he has a lot more. And I would say a lot of that is done with love from Pastor Mark. He's not hateful. He has a lot of love, but he loves the people more than he loves the tradition of copying things in the way they are. I'm sharing with you one that I, that we kind of saw together. Um, this is pretty unpleasant. Okay, I'm telling you. I'm telling you in advance, it's very unpleasant. It doesn't belong to the innocent mistakes. Okay, so I'm starting from Hebrews 8, okay? If you have your Bible, you can open it up. And this is the announcing of the New Testament, basically, right? And it says, and now he took, well, uh, verse 7. I'll read it in English for you. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay, so this is a justification why, do, why a New Testament was needed. Okay, fine, right? Um, but finding fault with them, with, who is them? Finding fault with them, he saith, you know, he said, right? Um, Behold, the days come. They are quoting something here in the New Testament. This is New Testament, Hebrews. He said, The days come, says the Lord, then I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Wow, rings a bell. Wow, this is a quotation from where? Jeremiah. Okay, now, right, from Jeremiah. Okay, I'll... Okay, so now listen to the words, okay? Finding it faults with them. Okay, and then we go on, and verse 9 says this. Not according to the covenant that I made with their father, with the fathers, in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, so far so good, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regard them them not, says the Lord. I regarded them not, and in Hebrew, New Testament, it says, and I was disgusted with them. Bachal tibem. Bachal is the feeling that one have just a moment before puking or throwing up. That's bachal ah, That's what God says about them, you know, in the New Testament here. And it says here, Okay, I, I was disgusted with them. Came in, I was about to throw up with them. But now look, look at Jeremiah. Okay, so the last sentence says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, 
and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me people. That's the end of quotation in, in Hebrews, right? Hebrews 8. Now listen to Jeremiah. So remember the first part was, uh, um, you know, maybe we can show you here. Um, all done. Jill, does it going to work? Jill, can you connect me? Okay. Oh, here we go. Nice, look. So, you see the blue there? For, for finding faults with them, right? And then, here is the blue one. So in English, I regarded them not. In Hebrew, in verse nine, I was disgusted with them. Look at that. This is the, this is New Testament. Now go to Jeremiah. So the he, the New Testament says I was disgusted with them. Bachalti in Hebrew. Bachalti. Just about to puke with them. And the Hebrew in Jeremiah says this. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was their master, says the Lord. Not I was disgusted with them, I mastered them. I was their huge difference, not a coincidental change here. You, you know, there's an intention to say, oh, I was disgusted with them, so I threw them away. Now I have you, the church, to be mine. Not, this is the falsification of a quotation. And let's be honest here and say maybe, but very, very thin and faint maybe was a mistake here. Very faint maybe. More likely it's not innocent, okay? And in Hebrew says, Vani ba'alti, not ba'alti, ba'alti from the word ba'al means I husband them. That's the word. That's the Hebrew word here. And the English says, I was their master, but the Hebrew is ba'alti, I was their husband. They were married to me. Not that I was disgusted with them. You see the distortion? This is what Pastor Mark is going to correct. He's not going to allow distortions of this happening in the Mark Builds Bible. I believe, looking for the future, this is gonna be the Bible for the future, for people that care for precision and accuracy of the word, and not falling into so-called respect to the traditions for the price of having mistakes and distortions. Not compromising for that. You need to be pretty brave to do that, you know? I mean, very brave. I mean, look, me, myself, years ago, they approached me from the high echelons of the Southern Baptists in the South, and uh, somebody by the name Reverend Daniel Freed, and they said, they want you to translate one chapter from the New Testament. And I took Matthew, and they wanted, you know, the top echelon. I said, okay, you know, I took one, and I did see some distortion, not as good as Pastor Mark can do, because he can cross-reference immediately for where things are coming, and I'm just translator, you know. But I gave it to them, and they were very excited, and they said, well, they're willing to give you, that, and that. you know, they're kind of big riches and stuff. And I, say, and I thought about that for a few days and we'll give you that. They're very excited of the translation. And they said it's well, well needed for many years. And then I came back to them and said the answer is no. I said, no? I said, no, the answer is no. And, and why not? But the main reason was that I was afraid that I will make a mistake in the translation and I will open what is called the spiral of distortion. Like if I tell you something false and wrong, you're gonna teach it to another person and I'm opening a spiral of distortions. And I did not want to be responsible. You see, they're about to print five million books like that and give it to different countries. And I said, no, 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 no. That, it, my mistake will be there and will cause mistakes of so many others 
I can take this burden and for no, for no money in the world, you know. And I, of course, I didn't trust myself to know well enough to even dare doing that. But I trust Pastor Mark to do that, and I will do any effort possible to assist in dissecting the Hebrew and checking every resource before it's put in, you know, his knowledge and his understanding. And that's why I think it's going to be a very, very, very reliable and, and strong Bible for generations in the future. It will oversee, it will supersede any, I think, many Bibles that are there because of his amazing understanding of the big picture. So that is the one mistake here, which is more than a mistake. I, I husband them, not I was disgusted with them, you know. Um, and there are many others, you know. This is not the only thing, you know. Regarding them not. I, it's not going to say regarded them not in it, verse 9. Ah, yes, that's the one, yes. Okay, um, another place is that uh, we can see in the New Testament inaccuracies is um, when it comes to the, and this is not my subject, it is really Pastor Mark's, uh, when it comes to portraying Jews in a certain way, one thing I was enlightened by the um, teaching of uh, Pastor Mark is um, one reference, but I don't have the reference here, so I can't say it. And I, I, know, I remember the verse, and it's speaking about, I think he taught it here. He speaks about the, um, well, in many places the word is church and church, but in one place when people came and did some hidden, some bad stuff, then the, 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 the expression there is the synagogue of Satan. So, okay, so satanic stuff associated to the Jews, not to the church, right? And, and why was that? We talk about the same people, the same believers. So that's another thing that needs to be, you know, focused on. And this is not the only thing. There are more, you know. There are, as Pastor said, there are much more. Um, um, okay, some words that they really slided over correctly you know, we have something here, like one of the stereotypes against Jewish people is the issue of money, you know. Money, yeah, there are money, money. Now, look, historically, money is forbidden in the Bible. I needed to show you something here. Not money is forbidden, but interest, which is the heart and nature. Hmm, what happened here? The heart and nature of business, of banking, I can go back, okay? Let's try it again. Here we go. The heart and, you have another three minutes or something? We do, okay. The heart and nature of money business is interest, right? It's forbidden, big time, both in the Old and the New Testament to take interest. So, but hey, I mean, hey, how do you run economy without taking interest? What do you do? So pious people, you know, and do you know what the word interest in Hebrew is? You know what it means, what it is? The word is neshech. Neshech is this. Jill, it doesn't come up. Oh, that's neshech. Neshech means a bite. Like biting somebody's flesh. That's how the Bible looks as taking interest. It's like eating somebody's flesh. Okay, so it's forbidden both by the Old and the New Testament. No, no, no interest. So who is going to do the dirty jobs? They took Jews and said, hey, you do this ugly stuff. You take the interest. Of course, they didn't keep the money. It went to the institute that hired them. But they were given the ugly job of taking interest in Europe. And... When you do that, you learn banking. You can't help it, you know. So that was the connection. It was not a connection that they took it by choice. It was considered to be one of the lowest jobs one can think about, working with money and taking interest. And they didn't want to kind of dirty their hands in taking interest. They let them do that. And, of course, the money went to the institute that hired them, you know. 
but they did the ugly job, the, you know, the bad jobs, the, the disgusting jobs, so-called, you know. So I think we're, we're done, right, with the time. So I want to thank you. There is much more here. Ask Pastor Mark about some of those highlights that he has. Um, he's teaching them throughout the years, but they come up now, and it will be pretty much an amazing thing for the world to, to have a good corrected Bible. And so Dara, about to you for listening, and shalom, shalom to everybody. All right, before you go, Danny, I just want to express what a blessing that you've been today and, and sharing your teaching with us and allowing Pastor Mark to have a well-needed break. We so appreciate you. I know Pastor Mark does, so bless you. Thank you All so right. much. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and we'll, we'll be sure to pass those out. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate everybody showing up and, and giving Danny support. And i um, like to uh, finish out with the ironic blessing. Yair. Excuse me. Yair Adonai v'yish mereka, Yair Adonai panavaleka v'huneka, Yisa Adonai panavaleka v'yasim laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom. You're all dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>